business. Okay. This is a, uh, a photograph of um, the late Bob Johannes at a meeting uh, which he and Ken Ruddle and a bunch of academics at the University of the South Pacific organised in 1993 in Suva, in which I attended uh, early on in my career um, in resource management in Melanesia. Um, Bob really got me inspired to uh, get into this work via his uh, wonderful book, Words of the Lagoon, published in 1981, and a, uh, a 1978 review paper, which is still very heavily cited today, which I want to talk about a little bit. Um, and it was Bob who inspired me to go back to the Solomons to, uh, to look at indigenous knowledge and, uh, and fishery management back in the 90s. Um, okay, in 2000, Fikret Burks, Johan Kolding and Carl Falke published a review in the journal Ecological Applications titled Rediscovery of Traditional Ecological Knowledge as Adaptive Management. In it they stated, taboos and other regulations are critical social mechanisms for resource conservation and have the potential of building resilience in ecosystems. And they reviewed a, a range of cases uh, of the use of TEK, traditional ecological knowledge and resource management, and cited Bob's work quite heavily in relation to uh, fishery management in the Pacific. Uh, the review inv invokes uh, several of the key concepts in the new resilience theory, principle among which is the idea of environmental feedback, uh, in which assessments by the, by the uh, resource owners of the state of the resource using TEK are fed back into decision-making processes that govern the level of hunting or fishing pressure so as to prevent over-harvesting of the resource and thereby enable the human population to adapt to the limits of natural production. Okay, this adaptationist model of the relationship between primitive societies, so-called primitive societies and their natural resources was in fact in common use by ecological anthropologists in the 1960s and early 1970s, and it has another name, functionalism. But they had thrown it out by the 1980s because the bulk of the empirical evidence actually didn't support it. Uh, and there are some examples about warfare, which I can give you later, uh, which are quite interesting. Okay, notwithstanding the fact that it's long been abandoned by ecological anthropologists, um, I should emphasize that an important assumption of the functionalist paradigm is that in order for a traditional resource management institution to evolve, people have to first encounter the limits to the particular set of resources in question. Um, and I'll deal with this in a moment in the context of uh, Melanesia. Meanwhile, in the 19, uh, since, since the 1980s, Jared Diamond uh, and others actually preceding Diamond um, have been challenging the fondly held notion that indigenous peoples consciously conserved their natural resources. And Diamond has assembled a lot of evidence for uh, his case in his most recent book, Collapse. Uh, in many cases, he shows that when people did encounter the limits to their resources, uh, it was too late and the uh, consequence was catastrophe. Um, interestingly, in, uh, um, in the next year after that uh, nature letter uh, from Diamond, Johannes uh, rebutted him uh, with, a, with a, an excellent rebuttal, uh, citing a lot of his own findings from the Pacific. Um, and um, I largely agree with a lot of what Bob said, so it's, it's actually quite a complicated uh, debate, this one. Um, okay, uh, s many years later, uh, after having done a bit of work in the Torres Strait, um, Bob later issued a qualification, a caveat, to his, his sort of main dogmas um, regarding uh, the low population densities of places like Papua New Guinea and Torres Strait, uh, and said that, well, you know, resources are so abundant re with respect to uh, the size of the populations in these places that people probably didn't evolve a conservation ethic because they never encountered the limits to production. So I just want to talk about uh, the, the, t the, in the institution of the taboo. <coughs> I'll call it tambu because that's what I'm used to calling it. That's what they call it in Solomons in Papua New Guinea. Um, these are very widely used across Melanesia and other parts of the Pacific. Uh, you could call them serial closures. Um, and there's a huge variation in the nature of these things uh, culturally uh, and institutionally. Uh, sometimes they are 
uh, erected in sites where people were buried at sea, and, and that some of these are actually permanent ones. They're never open. The place is sacred, um, and people just never go there. Um, in, some ca in many cases, they're connected to mortuary rituals. They're, they're connected to the fact that the, the funerary cycle, they're connected to feasts. People um, will put a tambu at some stage of the cycle uh, and then open it in order to get food for the feast, for one of the series of feasts. Um, but there are also what I like to call secular ones, um, where people just put a closure on there to stockpile things like trochus, um, for the purpose of getting uh, money for school fees. Uh, and that's actually quite commonplace too. Um, they're all underpinned by, <coughs> well, in the old days, they were underpinned by sorcery um, a, in a sort of a, a conditional threat. Um, and, and, and it's interesting to, to actually look at the history of tambus as they've been used in the marine scape um, because uh, in many cases, they're not as, as uh, antiquated as uh, some people think they are. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a review. Uh, this, this is a, a, a case of a, uh, a tambu. That's a cowry shell, which is a very powerful symbol in Melanesia. Uh, basically says, touch my breadfruit or my betel nut and you'll get sorcerized. Um, and what, what seems to have happened, I think, quite commonly is that that institution was basically moved on to uh, coral reefs in response to the increase in value of a lot of commodity fisheries. Um, and so there's a review by um, Colin Allen in 1957 uh, of land and marine tenure systems in the Solomons where he observed that reef tambus were actually rare or non-existent before World War II and began to be used on reefs primarily as a response to the dramatic increases of trochus uh, price after World War II. And uh, biologist Nick Palunin has, has also reviewed done an interesting review back in 1984 uh, for Papua New Guinea and found, also found cases of tambus having come into existence as a consequence of competition over uh, lucrative, lucrative commodity fisheries. Uh, included, concluded that they are more about the exclusion of neighbours than about sustaining yields. Um, okay, so here's a picture of someone I used to work with um, harvesting some trochus at the, end of a, at the opening of a tambu in the Solomons. Okay, fishery management, um, in my understanding, is basically the process whereby fishing effort is controlled sufficiently to, at worst, prevent stock collapse or at best, optimise yields over the long term. Um, and research into local knowledge about fishing in Melanesia um, basically shows that most of it is focused on uh, finding fish in space and time and not on managing fish populations. Uh, the latter requires knowledge about growth rates, size and maturity, fecundity, larval dispersal patterns, mobility of adults, and a range of other life history parameters. And uh, most subsistence and artisanal fisheries do not possess this sort of knowledge, uh, but scientists do. And I think there's now a growing push to uh, help make this knowledge available at various levels of society, including in the school curriculum, which is the focus of a project which a small team that I lead has been funded to do. Um, so, so pre-colonially, pre uh, traditionally, uh, traditional authority was underpinned, um, significantly underpinned, I think, by knowledge of customs and especially of sorcery. Um, but after a century or so of colonisation and uh, missionisation, um, a lot of these forms of knowledge are no longer as respected as they once war, were, and um, modern modes of authority are increasingly underpinned by Western education, knowledge of English, and knowledge of Christian theology. And the kind of information uh, that's relevant to um, fishery management, I think, is represented here by this uh, excellent graph that I've taken from a, a paper that Warwick, um, who's sitting in the audience, is a co-author of. Um, and, uh, and in the context of this model, which is a recovery model for bechamere fisheries, um, that, uh, that alley effect is a very important concept in fisheries biology. Uh, once you thin out the population to, to a point uh, of uh, broadcast spawning species, they're not going to recover, they'll just continue to crash. Um, so people, people kind of in, innately understand the sort of upper uh, two curves on that graph uh, because they know that if you leave things alone, uh, they increase in number and you can go and harvest, you can get a stockpiling effect. 
But the bottom two curves, I think, are much less well understood uh, in the Pacific. And so um, increasingly, uh, as, as uh, commodity markets have, have, have expanded, we're seeing the collapse of the high priced ones. Uh, th anything that's high priced, easy to get, um, and easy to store, transport and sell, uh, appears to be collapsing across most of its range in Melanesia. So there are some examples uh, on the slide. Um, and at the moment, the governments of Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands are all busy shutting down uh, the Bechtemir fishery because it's been pretty much trashed right across the region from overfishing. Um, okay. Um, it should be pointed out that knowledge and governance are related factors um, and resource governance I think is more likely to be effective if there's a critical mass of knowledge about the need for management. This, um, this excellent study uh, was released last year and um, the sites that I've circled there are actually sites that um, all use the tambu uh, as a routine uh, means of managing trochus fisheries and these are all very badly overfished sites. Um, so it's just kind of, in a, you know, just more evidence that the tambu actually doesn't work for anything that's under pressure. Trochus is kind of lucky in some ways because it's got a level of resilience in terms of its life history that it's quite hard to completely collapse it, um, but, it um, but it keeps, uh, you know, it just keeps ticking over. Um, the good sites are all co-managed, I'm told, um, with, with involvement from government uh, and increasingly groups like the locally managed marine areas network uh, and uh, Worldfish and other groups are, are busy doing sort of all sorts of hybrid forms of management uh, around Melanesia. Okay, fin fish are, are in a different category, I believe, um, because there are very few export markets for them. There are a few domestic markets. Um, but they're not, uh, they don't have very good supply routes in most cases, so uh, Melane in Melanesia, finfish populations are in, in reasonably good nick, um, except for things like Boldo Metapon, which is very vulnerable um, and is, is actually in a bit of trouble at the moment. Okay, so coming back to uh, demography um, and this, this idea of um, uh, functionalism, uh, the demographic data, that this is a, a nice kind of easy summary for the trajectory since uh, the year 1000 um, by a, an ANU demographer for the Pacific as a whole. It's quite a, quite a spectacular um, graph, I believe. Just ignore that dotted line, which is the settler populations. Um, but it basically shows that, that, it, that population growth was very low for a very long time. Uh, there was a big depopulation event as a result of introduced diseases from about mid-19th century through to about World War II. And from probably from about 1920, um, depending on where you, where you look, um, populations have been skyrocketing, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, despite these uh, dramatic increases in the past half century, coastal population densities in Solomons and Papua New Guinea are nevertheless very much lower than they are in places like the Philippines and most of Indonesia. Uh, you can see Java there, population density of 1,000. Okay, so we did some demography, uh, some population density mapping um, for Solomons and PNG, and you can see, you can see that, that most of the, uh, just remember that, that the limit for uh, bush fallow agricultural production uh, is roughly 100 people per square kilometre. Once you go over that density, you start to run out of food with bush fallow uh, swidden farming. Um, so given that most of, the, most of the coast of Solomon Islands is below 50, uh, people have got stacks of food security uh, even at the moment, except for a few places which you can see there in red, like Langalanga Lagoon, uh, which is famously uh, overfished um, and it's been, people have been bombing there uh, for a very long time, probably about 50 years. And indeed, Anna Schwartz was just telling me, she's the new leader of World Fish in Solomons, that um, someone was throwing bombs inside an MPA run by the FSPI there about three months ago. <laughs> so they're still, they're still busy doing that stuff. So that's, that's a kind of a, you know, a nice kind of demonstration of the relationship between demography and, uh, and uh, reef condition. Um, 
Okay, so, so two questions I think must be answered in relation to the tambu are, would fishing pressure have been sufficient in the past to cause over-harvesting and stock collapse of nearshore fisheries um, in the absence of tambu? Um, and I'll show you another a slide in a minute that, that, asks, that uh, provides an interesting take on this. How much longer have I got? Okay. Um, and, and given the large differences in fish, in measured fish and invertebrate uh, stock densities among sites where tambus are used, how effective are they really in terms of preventing overall declines in fish abundance and fishery yield? Um, if we make the same assumptions as the functionalists about these practices, that they are institutions that have evolved to allow people to adapt to the limits of their marine resources, why have they failed to prevent overfishing of high value commodity fisheries? Okay, Tikapia. Tikapia has a huge population density, and I think of anywhere that I know about, it's a place that fits the functionalist model. People have adapted uh, their social institutions to, uh, to survive on this very, very isolated island, somewhere between Vanuatu and Solomons, uh, and they have a unique form of arboriculture, which is a, a, a major departure from Sweden farming, and much more efficient and, uh, and, and more productive. Um, but on Tikapia, as far as I can tell, there are no marine management institutions. They don't have tambu. Um, they do have tenure, and they do eat fish every day, um, and they haven't run out of fish. They do eat a lot of pelagics. It's a place I, I'm uh, very keen to go to and, and check out. Um, okay, so why have I gone to such trouble to uh, you know, have a go at these, what I think are quite romantic ideas of a bunch of uh, quite eminent scientists um, about re tradition and resource management. I think it's because the implicit message, the subtext of these fantasies is that Pacific Islanders' pursuit of economic development really should be discouraged uh, in the interest of, of saving our, our, precious, our precious coral reefs. Um, Pacific Islanders should, uh, you know, instead stick to their traditional ways of living a subsistence life in harmony with nature and leave the pursuit of money to those in the industrialised countries. But, you know, what if they don't want to? <laughs> what if people actually want money? Uh, and everybody does. Um, and, you know, if we go back to the ancient sacred ways, we do need to remember that they come packaged with short life expectancies, high infant mortality, many maternal deaths and childbirth and so on. Um, so the problem, as I see it, is that there are many complicated obstacles to the fulfilment of the development aspirations of people living in, especially in Melanesia. Um, they include the fact that national boundaries were drawn by colonial administrators, um, that um, in a society where you obtain prestige by giving away material wealth, people are expected to engage with capitalist institutions which require you to accumulate it. Um, there are many. Um, the, uh, the commodities that they sell, uh, the prices are controlled um, by some, somebody else, so they've got no control over the prices. Um, finally, um, the, the fisheries and uh, the, the outcome of all this is that the ostensibly renewable fisheries and forestry sectors that are over harvested in a short period of time as men scramble for cash, which they all too often spend on status enhancing consumption. Uh, instead of health, education, infrastructure, communications, and so on, all these things that we need for development. Um, okay, this is uh, perhaps the most interesting image I have, and it's the last one. Um, populations will continue to grow rapidly as long as women are deprived of economic autonomy, and a number of lines of evidence uh, indicate that an important, though not the only means of achieving economic autonomy is through education. Um, so if we want to save the reefs of the Coral Triangle, I think a really good way to start is to pump lots of money, aid money, into education. Uh, I think it's a very important strategy. Um, so I might finish there. I'll just say that I don't. I think that um, development um, is so complicated in Melanesia that we need much better social information. We don't just need economics. It's it's got to be informed by really good uh, social data. Um,